Welcome to the session, get an overview on data integration with SAP Data Warehouse Cloud. My name is Hannes Kyle and I am from the product management team. With me today is Nida Tabatabai from the San Jose Sharks. It's great to be here, Hannes. Welcome. Let's start. Best run businesses are intelligent enterprises which apply technologies within agile, efficient and integrated business processes. Intelligent enterprises do not operate in silos. And one good example of this transformation are the San Jose Sharks. And with that, I'd like to hand it over to Neda. Thank you, Hannes. Uh, I'm Neda Tabatabi. I'm the VP of Business Analytics and Technology with Shark Sports Entertainment. Our organization is best known for the San Jose Sharks, our NHL team, but we are a lot more than that. We also have the San Jose Barracuda, which is our AHL team or the farm team to the Sharks. And uh, both teams play out of the SAP Center, which in addition to hosting Sharks and Barracuda, they host a lot of other events, including concerts. A day like today, we have Disney on Ice. We have family events. We also have tournaments like NCAA and Monster Jam. Um, in general, the SAP Center on average hosts around 170 events a year. We also own and operate three ice facilities across the Bay Area, including Sharks Ice in San Jose, Sharks Ice in Fremont, and Oakland Ice. Sharks Ice is also where the San Jose Sharks practice, and that's an area that we're expanding right now. There is a small arena that's going to be built in there for the San Jose Barracuda with 4,000 seats capacity. Of course, we also have a nonprofit wing, the Sharks Foundation, which since its inception has donated $17.3 million and more to Sharks, uh, to the Bay Area nonprofits and, and, um, and community organizations. Um, a little bit on some of the challenges in our business. Sports industry is a quite an interesting industry. It's almost like three, four different businesses in one business. Not only, of course, we're selling tickets to the events that we host. In our case, we also are selling, um, you know, hockey events and hockey um, programming in our ice facilities. But we are also selling merchandise. We are um, selling food and beverage. And each of these systems are third-party vendors. So you end up working with a lot of systems and some of them are even legacy systems. And each of them are managed by a completely different organization. In our case, our ticketing partner is Ticketmaster. A lot of other teams also work with Ticketmaster. But there are also third-party vendors that sell us on food and beverage. The POS system and all the back-end infrastructure for those organizations organizations are completely different. And then there's also, as I mentioned, the merchandise in addition to online retail. Um, then like any other business, we also have business uh, platforms from our HRIS system to our finance systems. What it, what it really, the challenge we face is, we have all these different systems with multiple different platforms and backends, and it's expensive and almost sometimes impossible to integrate these projects together and integrate, bring the data in a meaningful way together because of the different platforms the systems are on. So you end up with silos of data, um, you know, um, multiple different systems that the users have to go to to get the information that they need, and really not a meaningful understanding of what your customers and even sometimes your employees are experiencing. As an example, a VP of operation has to go to one system to get the parking information when an event is happening, has to go to another system to understand what the attendance uh, metrics are in the building as an event is going on. He gets a report from our retail partner, he gets another report, from our food and beverage partner. And there are actually cases that somebody's sitting there typing in information in an email to send it to a group of people. Not only people are getting this information late, it's also a lot of manual work. So what we were working towards is to, we were trying to find out if we can actually unify this data for ourselves. But again, we are a very small organization with a small resource, a small uh, team of IT and BI professionals, and we have a lot of projects that is going on. So spending a lot of money and time on a big data warehouse, which is typically a traditional data warehouse, has not been possible for us in the past few years. Till we uh, started looking at SAP's data warehouse cloud, we started doing a better project last year, and very quickly we realized that this is going to be a very different experience for us. We were able to establish very quick integrations and bring some of the data that we were looking for very quickly together in a meaningful way. And we already have a few reports at the door um, that I'm going to maybe give you an example of one of them. An example is an email ROI report. Sounds quite simple. Our email system is SAP's marketing cloud. And as I mentioned, our tickets are sold through um, Ticketmaster. 
bringing these two data sources together has been very, very difficult for us. But now that we have integrated these two data sources in our SAP Data Warehouse Cloud, and this report is actually done in SAP's Analytics Cloud, it's very easy for us to see what is actually, if an email campaign is going on, what is actually doing, how are the customer responding, and how many tickets are getting sold. In addition, what is really important to understand what is not working, so then we can optimize it and relaunch it and um, service our customers better. There are many different examples. One of our data sources is Park Hub, which is our parking um, partner. That report is actually already out. But as you can see, we not only have internal data sources, which are mostly SAP systems from SAP Litmus to Success Factor to S4 and Marketing Cloud, but also third party, similar like Ticketmaster and uh, Park Hub. What we have right now is again bringing all this um, data together in a meaningful ma manner. We have a long roadmap that we are working through but already we are seeing a lot more, and not only employee experience improvement, but we are also seeing a lot more efficiencies and we can react in a more real-time manner to what's going on with our customers and fans and our employees. Um, I'm gonna pass it on to Hannes now to can take you through more of a technical background of this product. Thank you, Neda. And that is a very typical, typical example where we need to integrate all kinds of sources. And Data Warehouse Cloud offers you already a variety of very specific connections, as well as some generic connections and connections to storage locations where you can load the data from files, as well as connections from partners like Adverity and Precog. And we continue to extend the number of connections continuously. And for that, I would like to invite you to have a look at our Roadmap Explorer, where we will continuously update the upcoming and currently released connections. Just to mention a few which will come this year still is the secure FS at FTP, where we can integrate into local files, for example, file shares on your laptop um, to integrate into that. And on the generic connection type, we are working on the REST API parts um, so that you can basically connect to anything that offers REST connections. Um, let's have a little bit of a look at the architecture um, sap data warehouse cloud leverages sap technology and for the remote tables we are using the sdi smart data integration technology and as well the sda smart data access technology to access remote systems and on the data flow so the etl side if you want to process we are using um the data flow engine from DI and DI Embedded, we have simplified that to have a quicker um, turnaround time here. What we want to connect on-premise as well to cloud systems, and especially if the on-premise systems are in a secure network, we need a bridge into the network. And for yet that, we are using the DP agent technology from SDI, as well as the cloud connector for SDA and our data flows. And how simple it is to create a connection, I would like to show you in our system on the example of a HANA connection. Connections are created inside of spaces. For that, I go into the space management, select my space that I have, and I find the connection tab. For that. Here we see the two connections I have previously seen, and I can simply validate these connections with the validation button. To create new connections, use the plus button and get a selection of the different connection types we have, whether these are partner connections like the Precog, where you need to have a Precog account, or direct connections like the Athena we created, maybe generic JDBC connections where you can upload the drivers for, or for our case, now let's use a HANA connection. The HANA connection gives me basically everything I need in order to connect. I need a host, a port, and the user credentials in order to connect to the database. And it shows me which features, the remote tables and data flows are available or enabled in this case. And this is, they're both enabled because we do not need a cloud connector to connect to a HANA cloud database. We can simply reach it directly. This will dramatically change if I switch to an on-premise database. I need to provide it a host and a port. And as the host is not reachable through the internet as it does not have a public domain, it is only reachable through a tunnel. And 
Therefore, we need for data flows to enable the cloud connectors. And I see the data flows are enabled, but the remote tables are still disabled because they also need a DP agent in order to connect the SDR remote tables against that. And I need a username and password. That is all that is required to connect. Next step, so I can get some advanced parameters. These advanced configurations depend on the connectors used, and these are the ones which are used for the HANA types. And I need to provide it a name. And I can create the connections with that. And as simple as that, I have created a HANA connection. As you can see here, there is currently no active real-time replication into that connection. And as simple as that, you can see which type of tunnel is required in order to get the data flows or the remote tables to work. Now that we have seen how to create a connection, how can we integrate those connections? We have heard a few terms like remote tables, ETL, and data flows. But let's look at what we have as objects available in the data model. And it's basically these three local tables, remote tables, and views. All of them are two-dimensional structures that have different abilities and capabilities. Let's start with the local tables. They are defined in Data Warehouse Cloud, and you have full control over the structure. That means you can define how the columns are structured, how they, what the keys are. You also control, have full control over the data that goes into the table. That means you can load with data flows into it. You can upload files into it. You can control if there's filters while you load into it. It goes as far as you are able to add it a single cell in that table. On the opposite to that, the remote tables, you do not have control over the structure. In remote tables, we are mirroring in a remote object, for example, a remote table in a database, like the HANA database we just created, and we follow the structure. So the structure is determined by the source as well as the data is determined by the source. You cannot edit a single cell. You have to enter the data into the source objects in order to see them here. And this is basically the primary difference between those two types of objects. And let's have again a quick look into the system on how easy it is to create a remote table. To create remote tables, we also go into the data builder. I will use a graphical view here to create a table. By going to the sources, I have access to all the connections that are configured in my space, and I can browse through it to find the source that I want to create as a remote table, simply by dragging it into my view and giving it a name that I would like it to be identified in inside of our data warehouse cloud. Note the little yellow um, boxes or marks showing that it's not deployed yet, but as soon as it turns green, now it is ready to be used and you can see it by clicking on it, I can immediately create a preview so that table is ready for consumption. Now the data we see here is created in a remote fashion or in a federated fashion. That means we forwarded the request to the source and live. And I can now build additional things in my view, like a join here with a table that we previously loaded through the data flow and the manual wrangling. The mapping is not done automatically as the names don't match, so I have to use drag and drop in order to create the join criteria. I can create additional processing steps or calculation steps in here, such as a projection where you could create calculated fields with Excel style formulas, or as I do here, change the name of a field to identify it as, okay, this is the pickup zone, just in case I will need a later need to add the drop-off zone as well. In order to make this view consumable, I need to give it a name, a business name, as well as a technical name. 
and I can set the flags, for example, if it's done, if it's used for consumption. You need to save and deploy it as we are using a separation of design and runtime. Once the table is saved, it is ready. Yeah, the view is saved, it is ready to be used. You saw me using a view to generate the remote table that is a typical modeling approach. And the view, which we have not talked about, is a little bit of a hybrid object between a local table and a remote table. As in a view, you are able to control the structure, even expand or collapse structures, but you're not fully capable of controlling the data that goes in here. Obviously, you can apply filters to not have the full set, but at the end, a view is a stored query. And which is used in either SQL or SQL script. So it is kind of like a distorted mirror where the remote table is a flat mirror and exactly replicates the source. The view is a distorted mirror which shows maybe only parts or has looks slightly different but still follows the input of the source objects that we are using. Let's summarize that a little bit and, and make it hopefully a little bit more visible. We have the the local tables which you can define in the system and you can fill through SQL clients like Juniper notebooks, um, through external ETL tools or our own data flows inside of the system, for example, of a file um, out of an S3 bucket or the newly SFTP connection. Obviously, you can also use tables. If your remote system carries tables, you can use data flows to ETL them into the local table. The remote table you'll see here is slightly um, grayed out a little bit, that is to symbolize the mirroring of the object, just points at a source object and every query we are getting towards the remote table is passed on to the source and this is symbolized by this yellow federated excess connection. And if we design a view, similar like we just did, you have the ability basically to consume that remote table and also, for example, join it with the local table. If you see this type of picture, um, there are potential problems in here when using these types of federated connections and problems can occur on the source system side that a source system is not sized to handle the amount of, of requests coming from a reporting solution or the amount of data that has to be transferred between the source system and remote, and remote table and with that the DWC is too large and with that would you know, push the answer times into non-acceptable levels, it might not be sufficient. And especially when you join in other source systems, you add additional logical complexity to it. That is why we have provided a very simple way of accelerating that by creating a table replica. It's basically a table cache. We can create responses and that's a fundamental design principle in ours, are always the same. It doesn't matter if you use the replica or the remote table, the response should always be the same. This is to simplify so that you do not have to model a data flow and a local table for extraction. Both ways are possible. Since similar performance problems can occur on the views, if you have very complex views, if we have cross-system joins or Yep, very deep views that require a lot of resources on our system. We have the ability to similarly create a replica out of it and use that as a cache towards the consumers of this view so that the answer times will be accelerated very significantly. To complete the picture, we can also use data flows as a staging tool similar like what you are familiar with in BW with transformations and DTPs if you need to stage data between two local tables. Let's have a look how easy it is to switch on a table replication in the system. We are going to start out with the view we previously created and we have the taxi trips table in the Athena database and I'm going to generate a preview for that where it selects the top thousand records out of that table and displays me fairly quick and answer. If I do the same thing on the view, we see that it refreshes, but it will take way longer. How much longer? Well, that we can see in the data integration monitor. If I click on that and choose 
the remote query monitor, I can see what is happening. The query I just sent for the preview of a top 1000 record took about a second to get the 1000 records and the connection is closed. And I see up here currently the preview that I just require, requested data for that is still running. If I look at previous executions I did, we're seeing that the request we are sending was taking 48 seconds and getting 6.4 million records. This is due to the fact that we made an inner join out of two tables which sit on different systems, the local table with the zones and the table in Athena. And since there's no possibility to push down the join, the system had to execute the inner join first with all data and because the inner join acts as a filter and only on that result set the top 1000 can be applied and therefore it needs to pull anything. This is a logical design flaw in my view that I built but if it's required how do we get around it? That's where we have the replication. So the first option we discussed was the remote table replication and that means we can pull snapshots or real-time replications if the source applies it. I'm going to do simply click for a snapshot so it will request exactly the 6.4 million records, persist them and from there on the joins can be pushed down to the HANA database and should answer fairly quickly. I do have the scheduling options available as we had in Dataflux. Alternatively, I could persist the view. This makes sense if we have complex view calculations, either by using an SQL script or complex joins or other things. On the one hand side, basically it acts similar as on the remote tables, kind of like as a cached version to accelerate the results. Alternatively, if I use aggregations in my view, I can reduce the data footprint inside of Data Warehouse Cloud. So if I do not need the full set of granularity that is available in a remote table, and we use either through filtering or aggregation, reducing the data set, view persistency can also help lowering the data footprint. And here it works. Similarly, you can use, you can load a snapshot or you can schedule a snapshot. You can always go back to the virtual access and hopefully the request is done so that we can see here in the remote table monitor. Yes, the data is replicated and you see that the DX access changes to replicated snapshot so it's no longer reading from the remote source. We don't pass it on. And we see the consumption of disk and memory. In this case, I modeled the table to be stored on disk. And finally, let's check if it was really faster. So going back into the data builder and our view. And let's see if the preview responds faster. And now actually we see it takes very few seconds. Now that we have seen how to create replicas and cover the basics with that, I would like to go in a little bit more detail into two specific connections which are worth mentioning. The first is the connection to EW systems. EW has evolved over time and so have the connections that we have to the different stages of systems. On the most simplest way, the BW on any database, non-HANA database, we only have the ABAP connection available to replicate through the operational data provisioning ODP interface the data that can be modeled as remote tables as well as on the federated access. Using extractors, we would recommend to use data flows for extractions as they're not really meant for federation. If the system sits already on a HANA database, so it's EW on HANA, we gain an additional connection type that is available, the SAP HANA connection, where we can use and leverage external views of info providers um, into the HANA database and pull those into the remote tables. Those are a lot of times way better suited for federated access. Should the system already be a BW for HANA system, we gain one additional feature, and that 
is the BW model transfer. It doesn't transfer data as it names, it transfers models. So you can pick a query, for example, and Data Warehouse Cloud will regenerate the entire model of the info providers, uh, of the underlying info providers into Data Warehouse Cloud and connect them to the source. And then the data will flow on the basic tables, basically, and the calculations will be done in Data Warehouse Cloud. This simplifies the modeling approach or the hybrid approach between W a lot because you can use those tools yeah, to build on. For a more detailed session, there is a session from my colleague Gordon Witzel with a session name Start Your Cloud Journey, extend SAP VW for HANA with SAP Data Warehouse Cloud or ANA 262. The second connection that I like to mention is the S4 HANA on premise and S4 HANA cloud connection. Here, SAP delivers content for the whole stack on all levels. Also, we can reuse the S4 HANA semantics of the virtual data models, VDMs, in form of the ABAP CDS views. And for those, we are actually currently working on a similar approach like the model transfer, where you can convert the S4 HANA virtual data model semantics to SAP Data Warehouse Cloud entities for selected ABAP CDS views. And you generate Objects allow direct analytical consumption and the usage of granular object for advanced modeling in Data Warehouse Cloud. Obviously, similar as to BW, the federation is available as well as the replication. And for extraction scenarios, you can use the data flows. And we from SAP, we want to deliver a broad connectivity to SAP, non-SAP solution, and be as open also to third-party tools to push data into SAP Data Warehouse Cloud. And we're doing this by supporting data virtualization to get quicker turnaround times when developing, but having the ability to replicate and persist if the performance isn't sufficient or as expected and we need the extra cash and acceleration. On top of that, we have the hybrid scenarios of Business Warehouse for HANA as well as MS for HANA or you can also use other hybrid applications that combine data warehouse cloud with a database like structures, similar like HANA or even Oracle or Microsoft SQL databases. With that, I'd like to conclude this session and point you at the use case factory and here specifically um, the use case of efficient model data and federated queries across SAP S4 HANA, SAP BTP, where SAP Data Warehouse Cloud is a product of, and AWS, because that is also something that matches the scenario described by the San Jose Sharks. And here are some great learning offerings to complement your conference. You can prepare for a certification in SAP BTP with free sub-learning journeys and live learning sessions led by SAP experts. Safe with an exclusive SAP TechEd certification offer that came in your TechEd registration email. Follow the learning recommendations for selected sessions to continue skill building and networking in a moderated SAP learning group to get your learning questions answered. Find all the great content at learning.sap.com slash TechEd. And again, similar like on the connections, I'd like to encourage you to go to the SAP Roadmap Explorer to see the future developing in SAP Data Warehouse Cloud. Thank you very much.